So this week at your seat, we're going to take a look at a CPG brand that's raising capital here in Austin, Texas. Our female founder came up from Florida and has been quickly growing her company and now is seeking additional capital. So we'll dive into her growth and her numbers and learn more about her as a founder. And I'm so excited to be able to share with this with you guys this week. Enjoy. Brianna, thank you for, for joining me. I'm so excited to hear about your journey and your company. Why don't you share with me a little bit about your background and um, what brought you to entrepreneurship? Yeah. So I would say my background um, is kind of, uh, I, I guess I could start off in saying that my parents are both like my dad's first generation immigrant, my mom's second generation. So everything um, that they experienced growing up was really out of scarcity and lack of abundance. And so their focus was always like, how do you create security and stability? And so for them um, and raising my brother and I, it was, you know, get a corporate job and you get a 401k and stock options. And like, this is safe. This is secure, like for you. And so that was really the kind of trajectory I started following out of college and study international business, minor in human rights, did humanitarian work in East Africa before going into the corporate space. And then I started at Under Armour, um, working in supply chain and manufacturing, just because I've always loved how global, um, econ the global economy works. And so I built out a sustainability program at Under Armour. Then I ran the sustainability program at Prana and Columbia Sportswear. And from there, I just found that I wasn't happy. I still like, I reached like the kind of the, the, the peak of like my space and it still wasn't, it was like secure and stable, but it wasn't giving me what I needed. And so really the 2016 election was an aha moment for me where somebody who I saw on The Apprentice and then this reality TV show ran for office. And I felt like that to me was like, there is no guidebook. There is no playbook to like how things work and like who's in charge and like what your story is going to be. So I just really stepped in and said, main character energy only. Like, what do I want to embody here? What is my story? What is, I'm a huge fan of the alchemist. Like what is my cargo I'm here to deliver? And so I realized that having these experiences working in, in supply chain and manufacturing, I had this unique experience that many people have never been to a farm. They've never been to a factory. They don't know how their clothes are made. And so I kept pushing CEOs to, to be more transparent about supply chains, to talk about innovation and automation. And I just didn't see them incentivized the way I was. So combination of a lot of different things. And one of my best friends is from Austin. So she, I always grew up coming to like South by Southwest and like all these events. Mm -hmm. And she's like, you can do this. Like you can be in the driver's seat of creating the change you want to see in this industry and like the products. And so that was really what brought me into entrepreneurship. And, um, it's been a really cool journey because I think I just love growing. And I think as a founder, like you're always having to grow if you want to keep your baby getting to where you want it to get to. Um, but my thought process has always been make a product that's better than anything on the market, have a vision that's bigger than just selling products and build community around it. And I think those are the three things that I've tried to do with an act because those are the things I didn't see other companies doing. And so I wanted to create that space for myself and for others to be a part of that. Oh, that's great. Uh, I bought a ridiculous number of your, your towels. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when you, <laughs> I remember when we met at Central Machine Works and you were like, cool, Amazon. And I, and I like saw, and I was like, I don't know how many she just bought, but like, you just need to try one. Like, it's fine. But I just remember you were like, -ra -ra -ra. and I was like, okay, like, yeah, let me know. <laughs> well, my, my previous okay. towel game, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, I went through this whole, uh, post divorce rebellion where I was like, I can just, my whole house can be pink and purple. It's going to be great. <laughs> and you know so what? I, I, I had decorated my, my house in something that was almost reminiscent of, you know, the scary lady from, from Harry Potter that was like all in pink. Oh yeah. She's so scary. Oh, this is going to kill me because now I need to know her you name. Know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The dark arts teacher. The, yeah. And the so umbridge. 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 Yeah. I was like, mm -hmm, my house is reminiscent of Umbridge. I need to, uh, 
did not. We need to come, we need to come back on to like Dumbledore side. Like, yeah. what have we done here? Um, Poor beige. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think we, well, so that's been interesting, right? Because like home goods, like in the US, is so focused around lush and, or lush, <laughs> plush, focused on plush, focused on colorways. But like when you go into spas, when you go into Europe, like you see a much thinner weave construction, you see a smaller amount of colorways. And so I think that has always been like, what are the, what are the different like touch points and like buying behavior here in the U S and then how do we kind of integrate, like what are best practices we've seen in other places and like introduce them here? Yeah. I love that. And I, at first I wasn't sure. Cause I was used to, um, kind of like the American towels I guess they're but mostly made out of plastic or something I don't even know um and then trying yours for the first time I was like okay this is interesting like and different um and after I washed them a couple times I was like oh I actually really love these um which maybe they're sort of like those um like sheets you have to re- wash them a few times and then they're like oh wow these these are my favorite now that is music to my ears thank you for sharing that yeah so uh what's next for you what are you kind of what's on your your near horizon i would say so right now we're building out the team and we're closing out our round and we're going towards the million dollar sales milestone so that's really exciting and i think it's like i'm i think for me as the founder like i'm getting out of the way i'm saying like i've taken it to this place best way to ensure this is a sustainable infrastructure that maintains momentum is for me to focus on what I'm good at and let people who are better at what they do than I can do it come in and and put their own twist on what we're doing and so now that's um it's scary because it's like letting people in and being vulnerable and you know hearing new feedback and new ideas but I think that the vision of an act of reintroducing manufacturing back into the U S and creating that infrastructure of dominating a very large market that has no brand loyalty of creating community around it. Like that has to be done through people. And that is like what I've, my biggest takeaway is like companies are built through people who see the same vision, have skill sets and can come behind it and bring it to that next place. And I think I was playing like, um, not safe, but definitely guarded, um, like building in Jacksonville, Florida, where I'm from, because I kind of needed the control, like, okay, every single customer experience is going to be this way. And like, there's not, you know, we're not going to bite off more than we can chew. And then I had an advisor say to me, if you play that way, someone else is going to see what you see and come in and take it. So you have to release control and you have to let people come in and you have to not be afraid to fundraise and bring in this structure and support. If you really want to see this happen. And so I think that's been since moving and expanding to Austin, like my biggest challenge, like hurdle that I've been working through. Oh, that's, that's awesome. And that's really great advice. Like the, the insight that a company isn't this thing, it's the, the people that make it, that make it. And especially in the early stages when it's, it's you and it's those first few people that you hire really form this you know, thing that becomes its own. Um, So that's really lovely. And the other advice about you have to lean into those places that you're afraid and, and go for it. Otherwise other people will see it and and run with it. And then you don't want to be that person that's sitting back, seeing what you could have done, um, make it big. Uh, Unfortunately, I've had that experience myself where I was like, Oh, we were so close um to have something really lovely and we blew it because you know for a hundred different reasons but I love that uh you're taking that advice and you've had those insights yeah and I think like yeah you don't know if you don't go and the more I've learned and I say this with all respect to everyone in the startup space I'm like no one knows what they're doing oh god right that's the that's the great open (laughs) secret (laughs) literally no one knows what they're doing and everybody is sort of like making it up as they go and there's this terrible (laughs) like game of confidence of like you know (laughs) 
Yeah, totally. So once I learned that, I was like, oh, okay. So I'm not alone. Cause I'm just very big about like anything I say, like, we're going to back it up. Like we're making this commitment. We have to do it. And like being very transparent. And they're like, you have to not be so transparent because people aren't used to it because everyone's bullshitting. So you have to learn to protect to some extent, you know, everything you're wanting to share. Cause it's legit and it's authentic, but people aren't used to that. And I was like noted. And I think also too, like I've a lot of female founders, I think we tend to play small, like small, medium enterprises. Yep. And so I think knowing like, okay, if no one knows what they're doing, hey. then like I can easily go into this space and I'm smart enough and I care enough about what we're doing. I will figure it out. So uh, yeah, there's two insights that you have there. Like one is this sort of like giving yourself permission to go big um, and to, to be in this place of ambiguity where you don't know. So it's a lot of times like um, women and, and they've done really well academically because there's really tight guard guardrails, right? Where you know exactly where you're supposed to go and it's a clear linear, linear path and there's guides that sort of permission you the next level. And in entrepreneurship, there are no guardrails. There is no permission. There is no thing. At best, you hopefully have great advisors, but you can also have shit advisors that point you in the wrong direction. And it's having that intuition. Uh, and then the other thing you pointed out, which I really loved, um, and I think it's the right way to balance the knowledge that nobody has any freaking idea what what they're doing is <laughs> is that alignment between what you're thinking what you're saying and what you're doing so it's like being in integrity uh with that builds trust and i think actually being transparent like one of the one of the things one of the tra great traps um especially as um our generation is sort of um, breaking breaking new ground and normalizing like entrepreneurship for women mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, we're almost out of time. Um, <laughs> <good> watch. <laughs> um, oh gosh. I lost my train of thought as my watch reminded me. You're, I was, you're good. I have a place you're to go. About women and like what we shoot for in our goals. And yeah. so it's, um, it's, you know, I like, I like the idea of, of giving yourself permission, permission to fail, permission to, to do something that's big, permission to do something that's scary and permission. Cause it's all about these sort of like agreements that we have with ourselves around the nature of reality and our, our um, capabilities. And um, on, on that train of thought, it's like, one of those is like to not fall into the trap of like what has worked um for for men doesn't always work for women the same negotiation tactics don't work the same leadership tactics don't work because whether or not we think it's fair or it's right it just is there's there's very different uh social um subconscious like group subconscious beliefs around that that um can have like dire uh consequences and I had to deal with that even this week where somebody felt that I was being very um, abusive to them when I was just giving them clear feed, clear feedback. And it's like, I can't just, you know, pat you on the back and tell you everything was great when I really needed these things to be different. So I invite you gently to think about clearly what I said and that I'm not upset with you, that you're safe, but also that I need support here so it's like and I find the only way which I don't know that this is uh, helpful to other people but it's sort of like I like to cut through the shit mm -hmm. I just say things and call them as I as they are and one of my favorite memories of which I had it had dire social consequences for me later was I was in a board meeting and um I I made a a, a statement and the room ignored it. And then uh, an observer who wasn't even on the on the board hey. repeated what I said and yeah. everybody paid attention to it. And yeah. I stood up and I raised my voice and I was like, I just said that. Yeah. And I just like, I made everybody stop and acknowledge that situation. 
And, you know, um, there was consequences for that because then I'm difficult and then I'm blah, 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 you know, whatever bullshit's in their head. But for me, it was really about the small self that I'm not going to roll over and take it and that um, I have permission to um, to go big and to, to stand my ground and to make a difference. And um, I'm not serving myself or this company by not doing that so yeah which is also part of that like permission to like fail and suck at stuff um so anyways yeah and I think about like some of my calls like my first calls ever like talking about the business and I like cringe like the things that were like asked and like my responses but it's like you don't know and like the way I've restructured is like failure is just not doing it. Like that's the definition of failure, not the actual, if there is a failure where you don't meet the goal. And then that relieves you to like do it right. Like failure would be like, I am just not going to run, but like, instead of being like, I'm not going to run at this pace, but like, if you go and run, like you didn't fail because you like showed up and did it. And so I think that's like how I look at with an act and like anything we're doing is like failure would be me choosing not to do it but like, I can't control every outcome. And I think like being a woman in this space, it's like, there's just so much tribal knowledge that has not been circulated and passed down. So like just the vernacular around, you know, remember when you you were the first person I heard say dry powder, I was like, Oh, never heard that lingo again, lingo before. Like, it's like you hear and you're like, Oh, that's what I was like dealing with. But like, no one ever told me that's what it was called. Like what soft circling means, like, you know, all of these things. And I think that that is like, what is the sometimes feels like disadvantage because like women can be doing like just as much if not more, but they don't know how to wrap it in the package in which the industry needs to hear it like whether it's an investor or a customer. And I think for me, um, it's, it is looking to say, but we have such a fresh set of eyes around things. Like, you know, when you move to a new city or new, go to a new place, you observe things more than like most people who live there do. And so I do think that like everything has to be seen as a strength, like being new to this space has its strengths just as much as it has its, you know, hurdles. And so I think just alchemizing like and saying like well here's where I need to go like here's my vision and like these are all trials and tribulations to yeah. pass through to get to that place that's how I look at it I think it's sort of like <laughs> I, lo- I love that that idea the way I've I've framed it for myself it's sort of like with every um yes I think so it's kind so of like bad. every personal so demon <laughs> it's actually a shadow of a gift and and so it's sort of like for example I'm dyslexic which Uh, and I'm also a writer so you can imagine I have days where I'm just screaming at Google Google how do you spell (laughs) yeah but the the hidden gift in it is that um I get to see the I see and experience the world very differently um which then helps me as a writer, um, be able to, to create more interesting content. And then like within entrepreneurship, especially, you know, as we are speaking to women, it's like, you know, everything that feels like an unfair thing that you're having to face, you have to turn around and look and say, okay, what, what am I, what do I have? That is my unfair advantage. So example, it's like when I was raising capital for my software company, um, a lot of my male cohort that I was a part of would come up to me like, how do you get all of those meetings? Like, what, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm nice to the startup staff. And um, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I just do. I just, so my weird thing that I was able to do was I was able to get a lot more meetings, but I also needed a lot more meetings in order to close on capital. So it's like, maybe they were getting a check every 50 or a hundred meetings that they took and I needed a thousand. So, you know, thank goodness the universe blessed me with the ability to get more meetings. So yeah. like, that's, that's the way it's like, if we keep on looking at all the obstacles that make it difficult to raise capital or just even be a woman trying to move through the world, um, then 
we don't focus on the path and we don't focus on our goals. Like, what do we actually want? So Exactly. And I think at this point, it's like comparison's the thief of joy. And like whatever cards you have are the cards you got to play. These are my cards. I'm going to play them. There's some cards I have that people would love to have that I, they don't have. There's some cards they have I would love to have that I don't have. And I think it's just like, we have to remember that's where, that's the growth, right? That's the growth. And so, um, yeah, it's cool. I never, I, I know we haven't really been able to talk about these specific things before. So it's, I'm grateful. Like you are, you inspire me that you're like, I raised, I did this, like I had this experience and you trailblazed, you know, and it sounds like you did it too, like later in your twenties, um, and in life. So yeah, that's not easy. Uh, I was, uh, I'll t- a short, sh- short story time. Um, I didn't, I didn't get to go to college until much later. Um, I just didn't, you know, your parents didn't find sign a uh, FAFSA and mine, uh, didn't want to do that. And so my college counselor was like, well, you can get married. You can join the military. You can have a baby. And I was like, I'm 17, 18. I don't think this is appropriate now. Yeah. It's not great. Uh, so I built companies. I, you know, worked a bunch of jobs, saved money. Um, sort of company oh, I just to, I uh, traveled right and then I had this sort of like I was in Argentina I had an epiphany like where it's like what do I actually want to do and um, decided I want to go to college and so I moved back to the United States went to college starting at 25 graduated from college 29 uh, sold the company that I built uh, got divorced and then started a software company. So I was like five years older than all the other tech bros uh, at the incubator. Um, and I was also the only girl for a very long time there. So it was like definitely like the odd duck out, but um, the incubator invited uh, my company and myself to stay at the incubator for longer because they loved having me there. And so I ended up staying instead of three months, I stayed for a year and uh, we were able to raise capital and our company also got hottest company um, from the, from that work. And, you know, I don't think anybody would have, when I first arrived there would have thought that that would have been the outcome. Um, But because I just kept on showing up and I kept on trying uh, and I kept on being um, so I'm gonna uh, like showing up as the kind of person I want to be, like a kind person, a welcoming person. I was able to 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 accomplish that goal, and that was also in that journey. I also ended up with a broken leg, and so I sort of am infinite, infamous um, for being like this very sad little. Like, During that experience. I had a peg leg, uh, and so I'm like trying to get up on stage with my peg leg. <laughs> That's it. I just wanted you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think so. That that's like inspiring, and it's like I didn't like my parents didn't know to tell me about women like you who are in this space and like what they were doing. Like it was just you know I think the step up was oh you can get a corporate job and that's that is the the move right. And well, I think our parents can only tell us, you know, I think every parent is sort of like wants their child child to do well, generally speaking. And so it's like your parents are like, go get a good job and a 401k. And that's not bad advice. And my parents are like, go marry a rich guy. (laughs) I'm like, I want to be the rich guy. (laughs) Yeah. Now I'm like, okay, I'll just have it all. (laughs) I'll just do it all. I'll just do it all. (laughs) Yeah. Anyways, uh, we've gone way too long. Yes. Let's. And let's if we need to do later, if if we don't cover it, I'm available later this afternoon too. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I know you have another meeting. So why don't we quickly switch gears okay. and show me your deck and then tell me an ask or two uh, that we can push out to the community. So an act is short for an act of kindness, an act of goodwill, the simple act of creating impacts. I really wanted to create a movement within the brand so that people could connect to the values of the brand instead of just the products of what we were building. 
And the first act that we've been working and or that we've taken and that uh, we've been sharing with the world is solving our problem of mildewy towels. Um, I grew up in Florida and I just like hate, hate, hate the smell of mildewy plush towels. And working in the textile industry, I was in China in 2017 and I saw how much the Chinese were investing in hemp over cotton, um, moving their military, their government um, uniforms all over to specifically hemp. And so that really sparked my interest. I did a deep dive into um, the legislation around hemp, the history around hemp. I learned a ton in the US and I said, I saw this opportunity that hemp would play in the agriculture and agriculture in the US, but also in manufacturing. And so I started brainstorming products and finding out that hemp naturally resists the growth of bacteria. It made sense to me that it should be used as a preferred fiber in bath towels. And um, in addition to that, I'm just a kind of a health nut. So I was like, all right, if the skin's the largest organ, we should definitely not be putting any harmful chemicals or dyes in our skin, especially when we've come out of the shower and our pores are super open. So we're going to use natural plant fibers. We're going to not put any chemical dyes on any of our products, which is why we have a limited color um, palette right now. And um, we're going to make it with this like thinner weave construction. So it dries faster. And that's what we did. So this is their solution. Um, so I roll packed it instead of if you see at the shops, like everything is folded kind of like all over the place. I wanted a really clean design. Uh, we have a loop on each towel so that can help um, hang dry. And we've seen a lot of people use that indoor outdoor use um, and, and camping and van life. And then we don't use any poly bags. So we use recycled um, paper to package that. And um, we put an impact score as well. So we did a life cycle analysis to say, hey, what is, um, let's make sure this is actually not greenwashing. This is more sustainable than what's on the market. And we're one of the first to use hemp. Um, so that has been the solution um, and that we've been working or that we've been selling in the market. And then the vision's always been much larger. Um, like we, in, at the beginning of our conversation, it's let's make this amazing CPG brand that has this, a phenomenal scalability opportunity within D2C and wholesale. But then let's shoot for something bigger than just having people consume our product. Let's solve problems. And I think something um, you know, that you and I always connect on is talking about the relationship between US and China and really like how that could potentially impact the US um, now and in the future. And so knowing that China produces over almost 50% of global textiles knowing the one child policy um, that has impacted their infrastructure of employees and, and their workforce and knowing um, the trade embargoes that have been put on, it was a no brainer that we should, we wanna focus on how do we actually make our product here as close as possible to the markets we sell to. So that's the larger play um, that Enact is focused on. And then the fun play in the short term is like, we really wanna create an amazing space. And I think that everyone's seen the impact of iOS 14 on D2C brands. And some people think maybe D2C is dead, but I think what's not dead is community, people having shared values, and so with an act, we really want to create a juice bar, coffee shop, where we would work from it. Our brand and product is woven throughout the shop. And that would be a grassroots marketing effort that we would do here in Austin. Our statistics to date. Um, so we launched during COVID, um, which is actually great because I don't know before COVID times, um, which I know some retailers are like, this was before COVID. And now we're in like, you know, that was our expectation. Now we're after COVID. I'm like, all I know is like, after COVID, um, during COVID. So it builds our, resiliency. The best companies are born, are born in chaos. Yes. I, I feel that. Um, yes. And so I think that, um, for us, we were, so we were successfully funded on Kickstarter, then, um, launching during COVID, we were going to go wholesale, everything shut down. We pivoted, we did the D to C thing, learned so much. Now we're getting back into like big box boutique hotels, gyms, um, but we're at 15, 20 K a month, um, in our monthly sales and, um, our margin sits at around an 80%. And then the channels that we've sell on, so we sell on Shopify, we sell on Amazon, um, our wholesale, again, like I said, boutique hotels, zero waste refill shops. Um, we've done some cool stuff with like the Houston dynamos. We're talking to Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, but the goal is 
where is there a reoccurring revenue and where is it scalable? And so that is, as the founder, I feel like my job to constantly make sure that like we're positioned for that, even if something might be what other people are doing and makes sense, like we have to do what's scalable for us. And the reason why we've been raising and um, it just kind of accelerating the growth is we rank number one on Google for Kemp Taos. So Google making us synonymous with that um, has been incredibly advantageous because as hemp trends, as eco-friendly and sustainability trends, we are able to ride that wave without putting any dollars into that. And so we've also seen Gen Z and other um, customers feel the sense of trust with our brand because of that organic ranking and that we're not paying to be in that space. Um, again, like we talked about prior, uh, just monitoring U.S. China in that relationship, I think it's going to be critical for us to invest in manufacturing and innovation. And it will also open another revenue stream, which is about a $1 trillion TAM um, within the retail industry for us to actually sell raw materials to. And this is just a list of who we've um, been in conversation with. It's been really cool to see just how many places the Tao lives. So we're able to have a lot of different conversations. And um, you can go to our website or go to Amazon and check out our reviews and what our customers are saying is I think sometimes as the founder, like, is this just me or do other people feel this way? And so knowing that other people value the product and its performance features is just like, oh, the absolute chef's kiss. Um, this is where we're, we've been, we get a lot of great PR and marketing. So we were featured recently featured in a pickleball magazine um, for like a sustainable starter kit for anyone starting to play pickleball. And it was just really cool to be next to Outdoor Voices and Clean Canteen and just several brands we really aspire and look up to. And then these are several other publications that we've been included in. So I do a lot of interviews on thought leadership around hemp and textiles and sustainability and just being a female founder. Um, so that has also been helpful for expanding the brand. Um, but then we also do stuff specifically on the product and the brand itself. And those were all driven purely from Google. We haven't had a PR team to date. And then our traction of what we're working on right now is we're closing this round to hit the million dollar sales milestone um, and expand our team through these strategic key hires. And we, once we get through um, that milestone, we really want to do like naturally dyed products. So we have some stuff in R and D, like using rosemary and blueberry and different plants. How can we be able to offer colors, um, but do it in a way that's going to make sure it's going to protect the planet and our customer. Hmm. And um, again, our long-term pipeline is like, I, one day Tiana want to be like, Hey, come over to Knox headquarters. Like we're going to get you a juice. Here's the team working. Then we're going to drive out and you're going to meet the farmers growing the hemp and get to see the whole process. Like that's, that's where we want to go. Um, so this is our trajectory to getting there. Love it. Yeah. And am I okay on time? Do I have a, yep. Okay, cool. This is our team. Um, we've added a couple more people since I, I need to update this, but um, there's a woman that I just met here in Austin a couple of weeks ago, who's coming on as our operator, which is super, super exciting. Um, so it's allowing me to step out and focus more on vision and creative and um, really just how do we um, get like an act out there and via PR, et cetera. And then she's stepping in to really manage these wholesale accounts and the more operational components of the business. Um, but yeah. I always focus on how do we build a team around people who get the vision, have the same values and have skill sets that can provide value, but also it's a growing opportunity for them as well. Love it. And then the, the, we haven't been able to do these in Austin yet, but we're actually working on one, um, an event or later today, but we love doing these act up events. So it's how do we get people connected in the community? So we do these like social and environmental documentary screenings we put together a panel of activists or change makers focused on those specific um, subjects. And then we bring everyone together to do Q and A's and to learn more about what they're doing and just be more educated. So our thought process is everyone's just experiencing different experiences in our community. And we become better human beings when we can better understand someone else's experience, even when it's not our own. Um, and so, yeah, we've done four, five of them to date. Um, but in Jacksonville, Florida, where I'm, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Hello at enact.com. Follow us at enact global. Um, and yeah, thank you for letting me share that. That's lovely. Thank you so much.
It was such a pleasure interviewing Brianna, the CEO of Inact, and learning about her CPG brand and how quickly it's growing. It's important to remember within the venture space, it's not just about software or even hardware for that ma matter, that there are a lot of different opportunities out there that solve real problems um, and have uh, interesting opportunities for investors. So if you found this one interesting, look at the show notes afterwards and in um, the comments, and you will be able to find more information about what Brianna is doing and the ability to connect with her if you want to learn more about her company. Thank you guys. And I will be back next week with another episode of Your Seat. Bye.